My name is Greg Henderson, and I'm here today to help you shift just a little bit the way you think about things. My wife, Jill, and I founded Arcs Packs, along with the rest of our team, with a mission. It's a serious mission, because we have the ability to improve the way we play, live, and work. And as an architect, what that means to me is I have an obligation to change the way we think about how we build, to build better, structurally, economically, to build more responsibly. So what are we going to do about this? This, of course, is an aerial view of the San Francisco Bay. And uh, you recognize us, we're down here somewhere. Uh, but that, that turquoise zone that surrounds the bay represents the 100-year floodplain. And the 100-year floodplain is a 1% chance in any given year of a major flood. And then 1983 to a depth of 12 feet. Surrounding that in purple is what would happen, the area that would be impacted by a 1.4 meter sea level rise. Now, all of this area is subject to liquefaction in most areas. The only structure that belongs there, the only safe structure you can build, is a houseboat. Why? It's naturally decoupled from the earth. Impervious to rising sea levels, to floods, and earthquakes. Now, if we look at the current state of the art for earthquake design, for seismic design, it's something called base isolation. And the way base isolation works, it's essentially a kinetic transform. It takes that short, fast shaking of the earth, and turns it to a long, slow shaking that the building can tolerate. And it's saved a lot of lives. But we're just getting started. Let's take a look at the International Building Code. What does it mean? Well, it's about protecting the health, safety, and welfare of the public. How do we do this? Primarily through structural strength. Now, I'm going to challenge that, that notion in a moment. But what they're really saying is that buildings are expendable. The purpose is for a building not to collapse on its occupants during a disaster until they can get out to safety. And I think that's a pretty low bar for our built environment. Now, relative to, to human life, I agree. But we need to do better. Not only do we need to survive an event, but our buildings do too, if we want to be truly sustainable. Last year, we were issued our first patent. And what this describes in 80 pages of detail is essentially a houseboat in a pool. It's a means of decoupling, probably the most effective, efficient, cheapest way to decouple a structure from the earth. And rather than rely on, on structural strength entirely, let's, let's build in harmony with Mother Nature and those natural forces. So how does it work? Well, we have a containment vessel, an empty pool. Adding to that a buffer medium, water. And in that, a construction platform. Now let's talk a moment about that buffer medium. The buffer medium can be a liquid, salt water, see the fresh water. It can be an entrapped gas. Why not an electromagnetic field? If we can hover a train, why not a house? Now, as I said, there's 80 pages of detail that cover the, the details, the access, the infrastructure, the utilities, and the egress. But that's the easy part. The hard part is overcoming human resistance to change. That notion that if something were a good idea, someone else would already be doing it. And that's what we're tackling at our Arts so let's look at state-of-the-art, and that's what we did. We went straight to state-of-the-art Magna trains. And this, this train that they are testing and building in Tokyo set a land speed record last week, 375 miles an hour. Now, it's a uh, very expensive system, very complex system, but an engineering marvel nevertheless. Interestingly, though, it doesn't hover unless it's going 100 miles an hour not useful for hovering a house. But it gave us the information that we needed and to go a little bit deeper and to come up with a way 
a means of hovering a dynamic payload, a building, in a stationary position. Oh, and by the way, that also means that we can move in any direction. Why was it so expensive? You can see it has these, these different systems for propulsion, control, uh, navigation, and because it can't hover unless it's going 100 miles an hour, a completely redundant set of tracks and wheels. Incredibly expensive. So, wasn't when it worked for our purposes, but we got to work and came up with a hoverboard. This is a, a simple proof of concept, right? A way of demonstrating that, that we can do this, that we can, we can hover a stationary object with a dynamic payload. We set a, a weight record last week, 450 pounds on this version. Uh, and of course, it provides all of that, the, the guidance, the navigation, the propulsion in one simple system. So you can start to imagine some of the possibilities. How does it work? All right, I'm practicing this. The hover engines, and there are four, they supply a primary magnetic field. Now, that primary magnetic field induces a, what are called eddy currents in a conductive surface. And those eddy currents, in turn, create their own secondary magnetic field, which recalls the first. Or, in other words, the hover engines create a magnetic field that it repels from in the metal floor. A copper surface, it could be aluminum. How about graphene? So suddenly we have this new tool, and we're able to think about things differently, which opens up all kinds of possibilities for magnetic field architecture. And we can combine it with some other tools that aren't being utilized to their full extent. So what does it take in terms of energy? 40 watts per kilogram. If you want to separate something from the Earth to overcome friction, probably the most efficient way to do it, relative to pushing air in the Black Hawk helicopter, one quarter of the energy requirement. So it others. What else can MFA do? Well, you can see here some of the capabilities. And when you start thinking about this new tool in these terms, the fact that, yeah, hoverboard, sure, by putting a couple of these together, we can do other things as well. If we can combine these with some existing tools, and uh, here's one of those tools. UC Berkeley's uh, Shape Alert, and it's an amazing tool, uh, developed uh, in conjunction with Caltech and the University of Washington. What would happen uh, during the 2014 Napa earthquake? Expanding from Napa in concentric growing rings was a yellow line. And that yellow line represents the primary wave of an earthquake. It travels 1.7 times faster than the red wave that would be coming after it. And there's a count now. 24 seconds. 24 seconds of time from that earthquake strike, striking in Napa, California to that little blue house in our lab down the street on the University here in Los Gatos. 24 seconds is a long time when all you have to do is activate a hover system. So all of a sudden, we have early warning. If you can imagine, now I don't want you to think about lifting a building. I want you to think about the building never moving. The opportunity for perfect seismic isolation. The earthquake happens, the early warning system triggers our hover engines, the hover engines start, the landing gear picks up, the ground starts shaking, the ground stops shaking, the landing gear returns, and that object, that piece of equipment, never experiencing any movement at all, unlike the traditional base isolation. What does it take to hover a house for 90 seconds? Because that's what we need, right? The duration of an earthquake. Well, turns out, um, not as much as you might think. 50 kilowatt hours, or about the energy in five car batteries. At peak pg rates here in Los Gatos, that's about $13.10. So, but I don't want you to get hung up on electricity. We can power our hover engines in a number of different ways, and there are a lot of ways of storing energy. Uh, we could even use combustion engines. Not our first choice, but we could. 
or rocket fuel. There are a lot of ways to store energy and we can take advantage of all of those. So I've talked about a solution. I'm going to leave you with a problem now. And it's a serious problem. It's not a matter of if, but when. Natural disaster will strike anywhere on Earth, whether we're talking about earthquakes, whether we're talking about tsunami, Fukushima. If the backup generators in the nuclear plant at Fukushima were on a three-part foundation system, there would be no nuclear disaster. Floods, hurricanes, other mother nature's bad days. The entire lower ninth ward could be floated. So again, in shifting perspectives, you're here to imagine, to challenge all of you to think. Think about existing problems and new ways to solve them. But right here, right now, there is a way to build better, to build in harmony with Mother Nature. And it's time to get started. Thank you.